It is good to be here, uh, and I thank God for the opportunity to come. Uh, I want <clears throat> to sing a song. I'm 70 years old. I know that's not old. Is it Alan? Where's Alan at? He talked about people having birthdays all the time. Uh, but uh, I do want to ask my wife to stand up. We just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Yeah. Happy anniversary to y'all. Happy anniversary to y'all, Gratzi family. Happy anniversary, dear Gratzi's 50 beautiful years. Happy anniversary to y'all. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. A lady gave Debbie a t-shirt that said, I've been married to him for 50 years, and I hadn't killed him yet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. But anyway, you know, serving Jesus is, ain't, no, ain't, no, ain't nothing like it. It ain't nothing like it, <laughs> serving Jesus. And, uh, and so, if I can sing this song, I'm going to try to. <clears throat> uh, it's called, I Sing Because. called patience. <laughs> I can sing it a cappella if you want me to. <clears throat> Acapulco. <laughs> you put it on the desktop. <clears throat> Let me just go ahead and, and sing it. I've been singing about my Lord for many, many years. It's coming. There it comes. Singing about my Lord for many years. I've sung when I've been happy, and I've sung when I've had tears. And some folk have even questioned if it's all been just a show. But the reason. I keep singing. I want the world to know. I sing because there is an empty grave. I sing because there is a power to sing. I sing because His grace is so real to me. I sing because I know I'm not alone. I sing because someday I'm coming home where I'll sing through all eternity. Well, I've sung to those walking, walking through some fiery trials. And I've watched their saddened faces turn into happy smiles and I bowed my head to whisper Lord please do the same for me and I'm proud that I can tell you he brought me victory I sing because there is an empty grave I sing because there is a power to save. I sing because His grace is so real to me. I 
sing because I know I'm not alone. I sing because one day I'm going home. Where I'll sing through all eternity. Well, I sing because I know I'm not alone. I sing because one day I'm going home. Where I'll sing through all eternity. Serving Jesus never gets old, brother. You may get old, I may get old, but serving Jesus never gets old. <clears throat> I've got a slide here I want to relax a little bit, start the service with, and he'll put it up there. Yeah, you see that? My name is, stop that! But sometimes they call me, get back here! I think Preston's got a dog like that, don't he have a dog like that? Oh, I tell you what, you know, we need to laugh a little bit. But I want to I wanna keep moving. There's another slide. I've got several slides here I want to show you right quick. This is what I'm going to be preaching about this morning. Winning over worry. When your kids <clears throat> look you in the face, they can tell if you're happy. They can tell if you're sad. And they can tell if you're scared. And they can tell if you're worried. Has your kids ever asked you, Daddy, what are you worried about? Mama, what are you worried about? It's your opportunity to be honest with them. And I hope that you will. Next slide. In Revelation, there's a text in chapter 18. Now, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet, but I want you to know I'm scared for America. We have turned our back on God so much. <clears throat> I'm scared for America. And I don't know, uh, but let me read this text to you. At Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, if you've got your Bible. Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. And the hold of every foul spirit and, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Verse 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. In verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers with her sins, that ye receive not her plagues. Now, I don't know if you're pre, post, or ah, millennial, but I kind of like that verse right there. That could be a rapture type verse, Alan, I don't know, man, where he says, come out of her, come out of her. That's when God calls us, hey, we're going to hear Trump one day. We're going to hear Trump one day. Anyway, keep reading there. Come out of her. And the next verse is, is in, starts with verse 14 of chapter 18. Look at verse 14 through 18 of chapter 18. <clears throat> and the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. And all the things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee. And thou shalt find them no more <clears throat> at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing 
and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company of ships and sailors, as many as trade by the sea, stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto that great city? How many of y'all saw a picture a few months ago of ship after ship after ship after ship setting out in the ocean because they couldn't bring their goods in? Next slide. Couldn't bring their goods in. This is how China brings goods to Walmart, powered by 14 inline diesel engines cruising at a speed of 31 knots. This line carries 15,000 containers, 207 feet wide, which means it can't even go through the Panama Canal Zone. The command bridge is over 10 stories high. Next slide. They unload so fast it'll make your head spin. Every single crane operates individually. They're bringing goods to us. They're happy to bring them. But one day they're not going to be able to come. If this text, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet, but if this text is referring to America as the great Babylon, it sure makes me scared for the United States of America. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> Jesus, isn't that a wonderful name? Jesus gives us a level-headed lecture. Or an unlevel world. We've got to admit that things are unlevel. Not in your heart, not in the heart of a believer, but in the heart of lost people, it's, it, everything's unlevel. I mean, old Amos held up a plumb line, and what did he say? You're out of line. But I think Jesus can give us hope. I want to pause for just a minute and tell you a story. A long time ago, there was a preacher <coughs> that uh, <laughs> uh, he retired and left his church vacant. And so the, the, the pulpit committee was formed, and the, the chairman of the pulpit committee was a deacon, and chairman of deacons too. So <coughs> he got on his horse, and he rode on down toward a friend of his across the creek named William and said, William... I want you to pray for us. We, we're looking for a pastor. He said, well, hey, my boy, my boy, little Willie, he's going to make a preacher. He said, sure enough. He said, yeah, he's plowing right over there. Go over and talk to him. So he rode his horse on over there and got a hold of little Willie. And said, little Willie, said, your daddy says you're going to make a preacher. He said, I am. He said, well, uh, we're looking for a preacher down at the church house. Why don't you, why don't you come on down next Sunday? Uh, I, I will. He said, uh, have you ever preached before? I ain't. He said, well, no, are, are you sure you won't preach? I am. Well, next Sunday, little Willie shows up, big Bible, comes right in, sits on the front row. <clears throat> and they start singing, and the chairman of deacons is sitting beside him. He says, little Willie, have you decided what you're going to preach on yet? I'm studying on it. Sat there a little while, sang a few more songs. Lady got up to sing special music. He said, Little Willie, have you decided what you're going to preach on yet? I'm studying on it. He said, Well, as soon as she gets through, as soon as she gets through preaching it, you're you up. He said, Do you like the Old Testament or the New Testament? He said, I, I believe I like the New Testament best. The lady is singing her last verse. He said, Have you decided what you're going to preach on yet? I'm studying on it. He said, Little Willie, it's time, it's time to preach. Do you know the story of the prodigal son? I do. He said, well, just preach on the prodigal son. You're, you're up. So Little Willie comes up to the pulpit, grabs a hold of it, and he says, Once upon a time, there was a Sadducee named Nicodemus who went down to Jericho by night. And he stumbled over thorns, and the thorns choked him half to death. But the next night, Solomon and his wife Gomorrah came by and put him on their donkey. And they were going to take him on down to Moses, where he was building an ark so that he could 
read the law to him. But as he was going through the eastern gate, his hair hung on a limb. And he hung there for 40 days and 40 nights. And afterward, he hungered. But the ravens came and they fed him. Three days later, the brook dried up. And three days later, three wise men came by on their camels and they threw him up on their camels and they took him on down to the boat dock at Tarshish so he could get a ship to Nineveh. And as he was going through the eye of the needle, they kind of bent down low. But when they came on through the eye of the needle, they looked up and there she was, there she was, Delilah sitting up on the balcony. She was surrounded by seven eunuchs. And he looked up and he said, with an authoritative voice, Chuck her down, boys. And the head eunuch leaned over and said, How many times shall we chunk her down? Till seven times seven? He said, Nay, but seventy times seven. And they chunked her down 490 times. And she burst asunder in their midst. But no problem. The disciples were standing nearby. And they picked up 12 basketfuls of fragments. And they started leaving the city through the gate. And there he was, hiding among the baggage. It was the prodigal son. <laughs> and so the disciples held up their basketfuls and they said, We got a question for you. We've been looking for you all day. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? <laughs> and he went and sat down. And the chairman of the deacons comes up and he says, well, well, he's, he's mighty young, but he really knows his Bible. I think we ought to call him. <laughs> oh, my. Well, that'd make you worry, wouldn't it? That'd make you worry. You know, we, uh, we do carry a lot of things on our mind. And we don't like to admit that we worry. But Jesus gives us a level-headed lecture for an unlevel world. You know, before I went into the, the uh, chaplaincy, I, I did disaster relief work. <clears throat> and uh, the tsunami hit over in Japan. There you go. And uh, we took a crew over there. 30,000 people died that night. And uh, we were trying to clean up some houses on the, on the coast there of the northern shore of Japan. And uh, there was a girl about 25 years old over there <clears throat> across the street. And we were taking sheetrock out of the houses in wheelbarrows and dumping it and taking sheetrock out and dumping it. And I'd been working all day. And... Uh, my interpreter was there with us, and I said, that girl has been combing the hair on that dog all day. I said, she just combing the hair on that dog all day. He said, would you like to go meet her? And I said, well, I, yeah, we'll take a break and go talk to her. So I went over there. She was, couldn't speak English, so he interpreted for me. And uh, she said, when I heard the alarm go off that, there was an earthquake and that there was going to be a tsunami. I jumped in my car and started toward the beach where my mother and dad live. But I didn't make it. The ocean water was coming in, hitting my car, and I couldn't drive against the current. And so finally I just got out of my car and tried to run against the current, and I couldn't. It was too strong. got over my head. I, I swam to a, to a house and got behind the house and climbed up on the the, the air conditioner and then jumped up on top of the roof of the house and the water just kept coming up and kept coming up all the way to the roof of the house. I spent the night on top of that roof. It snowed. My coat was in the car. I thought I was going to freeze to death. <clears throat> the next morning, the water had receded, the ocean water. And I jumped down on the air conditioner and jumped down on the ground 
and I went three blocks further <clears throat> toward the coast to see where my mother, father, and my son were. And when I got there, my mother was laying in the living room with my son laying between her legs, and he had his hands up like this, and Mama was holding his hands. They were dead. I never found my father. <clears throat> and this was my son's dog. I felt about that tall. You ever judge somebody wrong? Hello? You ever, you ever judge somebody wrong? I said to myself, or actually to Jesus, I said, Jesus, you can comb the hair on that dog all day long. It don't bother me anymore. That girl had a lot to worry about. And I think <clears throat> trauma comes in our lives and it, and it just knocks us off high dead center and we don't know what to do. But I want to ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. <clears throat> we don't like to talk about worry. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, we are so sophisticated now, we don't use the word, I'm worried, anymore. You know what we use? I'm stressed. It's sort of okay to say I'm stressed out. But here's the deal. You take a clean sheet of paper and run it through a printing press, and when that press presses all those words on that paper, it literally changes the face of that newspaper. And that's what stress does to me and you. When it presses upon us, it changes our attitude. It changes the way we sleep. It changes the way we think. It changes the way we react. Many times we react out of fear, we react out of anger, and we, we react out of bitterness. I saw a sign on a church coming over here a while ago from Palestine, some church, and it said, Bitterness is the acid that eats the cup from the inside out. I thought, boy, that's a good statement, and that's what it does. Let me read. Our text, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father, yet your heavenly Father, Yet, who? Your heavenly, your heavenly Father feeds them. That's amazing. Are you not much more better than they? Look at verse 27. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to, unto his stature? And verse 28, and why take ye thought of raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? <clears throat> Verse 31, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. And your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. In verse 31, 33, excuse me. <clears throat> but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Father, we want to say that we love you. 
But Lord, there are times in our lives when <clears throat> the sea comes in and we're not strong enough to combat it. We're not strong enough to, to handle the current. Now, Lord, I don't know what these folks are struggling with or what they've been struggling with. Lord, I know what it's like to struggle. And I know what it's like to bend my knee and beg for help. Lord, we are needy people. You, you are so kind and you are so compassionate. No wonder Isaiah calls you wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father. No wonder because that is who you are. Lord, help us today to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus wants to help us. And he will give us counsel and command. Now, it's one thing to have some counsel, but it's another thing to have a command and say, this is what I want you to do. He says in verse 25, take no thought for your life. <clears throat> nobody likes to talk about death <clears throat> I've been I started I worked for the railroad for for 15 years <clears throat> right out of high school and uh, uh, and we have to learn how to witness it <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily just come natural we have to actually learn how to tell other people about Jesus and uh, I played baseball it took me a long time to get that get that level cut down how many times do you think I batted and batted in practice for 10 years I was a pitcher how many times do you think I threw it as a matter of fact I threw so much I threw my arm away when I was 14 years old I couldn't play baseball anymore because I was constantly pitching You and I, sometimes when we witness, if it don't work the first time, we give up. That's, a, that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Listen, man, just because somebody made fun of you that you're a Christian, just because somebody laughed at you because you didn't know the Bible verse just exactly right, just because somebody said, oh, you're going to tell me about God, you self-righteous idiot, you ain't fooling me, you're sorry as I am. You know, you know how people are. Just because they say all those things to you, get back in the batter's box and keep hitting that ball. You keep telling people about Jesus. You keep telling them about his love. You keep telling them about what's going on in life. Here it is. <clears throat> we worship God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But right here in our text is a secular trinity. It is a snare to many. The God of food, the God of drink, and the God of clothes. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, and what you shall wear. You get you a note, little notepad. <clears throat> and this week, <clears throat> whenever you're feeling anxious, just write down what you're thinking and what you're doing. When you feel anxious again, write down what you're feeling and what you're doing. When you're feeling anxious again, write down what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you're doing. And by the end of the week, it may surprise you. A lot of the times when you're anxious, it's what you shall eat, what you shall drink, and how you're going to look, what you shall wear. Jesus <clears throat> is sitting right beside us in this next slide. And he says, hey, you're coming apart at the seams. When I was a little boy, my mama sewed all of our clothes. She sewed my sister's dresses, and she sewed mine and my brother's shirts. <clears throat> and she was sewing one day, and I went back there to her room for something. I was probably six or eight years old. 
and she just held up a piece of cloth and it was just coming unraveled at the bottom and uh, I don't even know what she was making but I remember the moment when she said look at that this material is coming apart at the seams I'm going to have to and I forget the word she used something about fold it over and sew it hem it thank you <clears throat> Then I came across this passage of scripture when I got older. When I studied the Greek here, worry, take no thought, literally means to come apart at the seams. And the only person that can hem you up is Jesus Christ. Did you know that <clears throat> the National Institute of Mental Health put out a report in January and they said that 44% of Americans are on depression medication. 44% of Americans. That's over 150 million people. Economists did a study, and they decided that when people are depressed, they're not as productive as they are when they're feeling good and hitting on all eight cylinders. And as they did a study on this particular topic, they said because 150 million people in America are worried, that costs us more than a trillion dollars in lost productivity. More than a trillion dollars. How's your productivity going? Jesus also gives us counsel and command, but he also gives us an argument that you and I can understand. Look at the next verse, next slide. <clears throat> Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment. We need to tap into the logic of the Lord Jesus Christ here. These are not just words on the page. Without hunger, there's no need for food. Without thirst, there's no need for water. And without a body, there's no need for clothes. None of you knew when you were going to be born. And none of you knew whether you were going to be male or female. But God did. And none of you know when you're going to die. But God does. Job 14.5 says man's days are numbered. So if God can make this kind of provision for you to give you life, bring you into this world, can he also complete the other half of the puzzle? And you need to quit worrying about it. People don't want to talk about death. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, and what you shall wear is the secular trinity. A lady became ill in our community several years ago. <clears throat> she went to the ho her husband took her to the hospital. They ran all kinds of tests on her. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. <clears throat> the doctor was stumped and her older sister told her husband said I'm going I'm going to go spend the night with sis in the hospital and just talk to her like we used to do when we slept in the same bed as kids back home. <clears throat> They were both, you know, older and married and had kids. And so as she <clears throat> was sitting there in the hospital, pulled her chair right up beside the bed, they began to talk like they did when they were kids. <clears throat> and about 1 o'clock in the morning, her sister said to her with tears in her eyes, Do you realize that in two days I'm going to be 30 years old? That's what it was. She was worried about turning 30 years old and she'd lost her appetite. She couldn't sleep at night. She made herself sick. My mother called my aunt one day to wish her a happy birthday. And when she got her on the phone, she said, well, happy birthday. What you been doing today? Oh, I've been crying all day. Oh, what's wrong? I'm 60 years old. Now, you know, we laugh at that. 
But I'm going to tell you what. People can't get over that fact that they're getting older. And here's the deal. You need to get over it. <laughs> <coughs> I want to mention another thing. Not only does Jesus give us an argument that we can understand when he says, take no thought for your life, what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. But he also gives us illustrations to explain, and I personally love this part of the passage. Look at verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air. Illustrations to explain. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Would you turn to your neighbor and say, you're a whole lot better to God than the birds. Because you are. You know, we live in an affluent society, but we get our needs all mixed up with our wants. And this text is solid. God will meet our needs, but now he's not going to open you up a charge account at one of the finest restaurants in town. And he's not going to open you up a charge account at the biggest department store in Texas. But he will. He will take care of you. And he gives us this illustration to explain. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds. He says, behold. The King James translates that Greek word, see, 38 times. The King James translates that same Greek word, behold, seven times. Translates it, look, three times. Prophesy, two times, and provide, once. By definition, that Greek word means to perceive with intelligence. To perceive with intelligence. You know, Jesus asked a guy one time in the New Testament, how do you read it? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? <clears throat> what he's saying right here when he says, look at the birds... He said, I want you to look and see how high they build their nests off the ground. I want you to look and see what they build their nest out of. I want you to see how many eggs they lay in the nest. I want you to see how big the eggs are. I want you to see what color the eggs are. I want you to see if they got spots on them or not. I want you to see who sets on the eggs. I want you to see how long it takes the eggs to hatch. I want you to see who feeds the baby birds. I want you to see how long the baby birds take the feather out and how long it takes them to grow up and make a nest themselves and whether they build their nest. Is it close by? Is it far away? Is it near? What? How many and how long does it take them to mate and have eggs of their own? When he says, look, behold, at the birds, what he's saying is, I want you to perceive with some kind of intelligence. Don't you say, well, that's a pretty bird. No, he wants you to look at it. He wants you to study it. Because he's going to tell you something about that bird that's pretty dead gum important. Here's what he says. Birds cannot plan ahead. Behold the fowls of there, they sow, they reap not, neither do they build in barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Look at the next slide. Birds cannot plan ahead. They cannot produce any goods, and they don't store anything away for the future, which means they ought to die in one day. But they don't. Your heavenly Father feeds them. And you laughed a while ago when you told your neighbor, God loves you a lot more than the birds. But it really is not funny. And I don't mean that ugly. Please don't take me there. He loves you. He wants to help you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to speak to you. And I like to say it this way. He wants to embrace you. Did you know that there are 320 different kinds of hummingbirds? I like to fell over when I read that. <clears throat> the tiniest hummingbird is the bee hummingbird. It is two and an eighth inches long, and it weighs five grams. That's like holding two aspirins in your hand, and you can't even feel them. I mean, you know, they're there, but you can't even feel them. But yet that tiny bird leaves Canada, comes all the way across the North American continent, 
goes all the way down and, <clears throat> and, and keeps it uh, through the, across the United States over the Gulf of Mexico, and they go all the way to the Panama Canal Zone. Scientists are baffled to this day how they do it because they know they have to have nectar. They know they have to have food. How in the world could that little bird fly that far? It's impossible. But Jesus gets them there every year. Does it year after year. Been doing it a whole lot longer than me and you living. Some scientists seem to believe that that the hummingbird will fly up to a flock of geese and they will bury themselves up underneath the neck feathers of the, of the geese and they will lick the oil off of the geese's skin while it's flying and inside the, the, dial, the down, the, the, the feathers, they're warm and they don't freeze to death and the geese literally take them on their trip but they don't know because they never have talked to any geese about it. So then the geese ain't talking. I mean, you know, they're taking contraband. But this passage, Jesus is trying to say, you can't add one inch to your height. You can't add one hour to your life. The Palestinian Jew was probably about five, five, four inches tall. And what he was saying to them is, you just because you want to look those Roman soldiers in the eye and you can't because they're bigger, they're taller, they're brawnier, and you're envious of them, but I'm here to tell you, you're not going to grow an inch taller and you're not going to live a day longer. And he says, take no thought of your life. That does not mean don't pay attention to your life. That's not what that means. Jesus says, look at the birds, but he also says, look at the lilies. Look at verse 28 and 29. Next slide. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now he's not talking about a hothouse lily. He's talking about a lily that grows right out in the middle of the field. And when I went to Israel, I saw one. And I said, I know it. Boy, Lord, that is beautiful. Even Solomon, not arrayed like one of these. Some economists decided that they would do a little study and figure out just exactly how Solomon was arrayed. And they said, well, <clears throat> if we had to build his temple today, if we had to build Solomon's temple today, it would cost $216,603,576,000. And that doesn't include the iron, the ivory, and the brass. Nor does it include the cedars from Lebanon, nor does that cost include the 153,000 men that took seven years to build it. So the cost to rebuild the temple would be astronomical. So, how fancy do you think Solomon's threads were? And Jesus said, I'm not impressed. That lily is more beautiful. And it's here today, and what? Gone tomorrow. Here today, gone tomorrow. Next slide, verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O oh, ye, a little faith. Now I want to ask you to turn to your neighbor and say that. O oh, ye, a little faith. Worry is a leech on your life. Worry is a leech on your life. You've got to turn loose of it. You've got to turn loose of it. He's using, <clears throat> in the next slide, he's using animal life, he's using plant life, and he's using your appearance to try to talk to you. He's given us counsel and he's given us commands. He's given us illustration to explain, but I want to close with this. He's given us the facts to face the future. And that's what you need. Here's the rubber meets the road. He's given us the facts to face the future. Verse 31, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? 
For after all these things the Gentiles seek after, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. <coughs> Here we are in the United States of America. It's all about comfort. It's all about cups, and it's all about clothes. When I worked for the railroad, I used to run a train to Texarkana and run a train to Houston and run a train to Angleton. We'd bring chemicals out of, out of Angleton. Uh, they called it the death train. If, the, if that train would derail and blow up, it'd blow half of Houston apart. But the biggest train, heaviest train that I ever ran, I picked up in Palestine, Texas, to take to the port of Houston. 140,000 horsepower and 140,000 tons of shell corn. That was 1979. We gave that corn to Russia because they were starving to death. You see, America has been known in the past as the breadbasket of the world. Because God warned us to give it. But because we've become so selfish, I've watched him destroy many crops, destroy our economy, shut down our power grids. And I don't know if that passage in Revelation is calling America Babylon. I don't, I don't know. But I think we're worried about the wrong things. And until we get our mind, what was that song Bear just led y'all in? I got my mind. No, it wasn't Bear. It was, it was a pastor. Pastor was saying, I got my mind stayed on. Yeah. And that's what he's saying right here. Listen, the logic of the Lord Jesus is some kind of logic. And we've got to lock into it. If you go to yesterday and bring up all the past, and then you jump ahead to tomorrow and start worrying about that and bring that into today, you got yesterday, today, and tomorrow all tied right here, and you, you can't do it. You can't do what you got to do today because you're too tied up with yesterday and too tied up with tomorrow. By the way, let me help you with a little illustration. When you get in your car, you move forward. How big is that windshield in front of your car? Real big, isn't it? When you want to look back, you look in your mirror. How big is your mirror? Reason being is you're not, you're not made to keep looking back. You're made to look. And the way you do that is you seek first the kingdom of God. When I was a boy in high school, one more illustration and I'll close. When I was a boy in junior high school, excuse me, I had a friend named Kenneth Phillips. We played basketball together, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. I preached his funeral about three weeks ago. Old Kenneth. We were in chemistry class. I think we was like 7th or 8th grade. And my teacher said, Charles, I want you to go to the metal fab shop, and I want you to get some drill shavings, those curled metal shavings. And of course, you know, I was excited to get to leave class and go do something, go down the hall. So I went down the hall, talked to my metal shit fat tick. He gave me some drill shavings. First of all, he wanted to know what I wanted to do with them, and I told him. So I, he put them in a bag, and I brought them back. <clears throat> when I got back to the class, Mr. Brumlow, our teacher, had a big poster board. <clears throat> and he called Kenneth up, and Kenneth held two ends of the poster board, and I held the other two ends of the poster board. And Mr. Brumlow took those metal shavings and he just sprinkled them all over that poster board. And then he said, Class, I want to show you the power of a magnet. And he took a magnet and he went up underneath that poster board and 
immediately all those metal shavings <laughs> come right to the middle. And then he just started moving it around wherever he wanted it to go. And I thought of this passage. If I could see first today, God give me a little glimpse back and said, just like Mr. Brumlow showed you the power of something coming underneath, if I just let Jesus come underneath, every worry, every fear, every distress I got, he can bring it right together. And then he can just take me wherever he wants me to go and make it so easy. Now, please don't take me wrong when I say this, please. God has put over $50,000 in my checking account from time to time to send me to other places to preach. I can't take any credit for it. I never paid my way to go anywhere. But I preached on every continent but Antarctica, and God sent me. And I'm here to tell you, if you, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to beg you, if you will seek first, if you will get rid of the trash, if you will give it up, take no thought, don't come apart at the seams, he will pull everything you've got together. And he will move you wherever he wants you to go. He will help you say whatever he wants you to say. He will stand you in front of kings just like he did Paul. And when Paul stood in front of those kings, he did not say, I have written 13 books in the New Testament, buddy. No, he didn't say nothing like that. All he did was, was, King, one day I was on a road to Damascus and Almighty God, Jesus Christ, he told him his testimony. And I'm here to tell you, if you'll get in, get in front of people and just tell your testimony, he'll take you to places you'd never imagine you would go. But he won't take you anywhere till you surrender your will. Jesus, <coughs> they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, <coughs> would you teach us how to pray? <coughs> and Jesus said, okay, pray like this. Our Heavenly Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on, on earth as it is. All right, now, let's, let's, let's look searchingly and significantly at that passage. What he was saying is a blanket statement. Thy will be done on earth is a blanket statement. You don't have to twist the Greek, add to the Greek. What Jesus was saying is thy will be done in the minds and the hearts of men and women on earth just as thy will is done in the minds and hearts of men and women in heaven how obedient do you think the people are in heaven Jesus Christ gives us a principle to desire to live an obedient life a surrendered life a sacrificial life are you familiar with sacrifice Seek ye first the kingdom of God and you won't have time to worry about all that other stuff. You'll be found in the middle of this book. You'll be found meditating about this book when you lay down at night on your bed. When you wake up in the morning, you know, 
people talk about the presence of God. When I wake up in the morning, before I even open my eyes, I feel his presence. And I say, good morning, Lord. My God don't sleep, nor does he slumber. Do you know that when we go to heaven, there's not going to be any night, and you're never going to sleep again? 24-7. Now, I want to close with this. Isaiah said, Thus saith the Lord God, you, I say, you are my witnesses, that I am God, and beside me there is no other. You, I say, are my witnesses. <clears throat> are you telling people about Jesus? If you're not telling people about Jesus, it could be that you really don't truly know him as your Savior. You talk about what you see and know. Everybody wants a Savior. I tell inmates this all the time. Everybody wants a Savior. A Savior takes your sin away. A Savior takes your guilt away. A Savior gives you blessings. A Savior saves you from hell. And a Savior takes you to heaven. Everybody wants a Savior. But not everybody wants a King. Because a King tells you what to do. If you don't feel like Jesus is telling you some things to do during the week, something's wrong. Because he's talking. He, he doesn't operate in a corner. He's talking to you and to me. And if Jesus is not your king, he is not your savior. He can't be your savior if he's not your king. I'm going to ask Alan to come.